Bibles to uh, Matthew 24, we're in verse 29, second part of where we started last week. Before we jump in, certainly one of the things that we saw is, um, that is relevant to what's going on in Israel today, is that there, there's obviously going to be a, and we'll mention in our text tonight, uh, this growing anti-Semitism, uh, this growing, uh, the, what we're calling the new anti-Semitism, which is to be against Israel and so forth. This all began back in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the 1960s. In the 1960s, uh, you had uh, the, uh, a shift in the United Nations where you had more Arab nations, more Muslim nations, uh, taking on more of a, a prominent uh, role. Uh, and, uh, and of course, with that, in other third world countries, uh, and with that, uh, with the kind of with the... Um, the pressure of the use of their oil and oil money and so forth, uh, they were able to begin pressure to turn the UN to be against Israel on, on pretty much everything. It began back in the 1960s. Uh, and then in 1973, there was this thing called the Arab oil embargo. I don't know, see, uh, that's when you had to wait in line to get gas, if you're unfamiliar with that, but uh, it like many hours sometimes, and people were stealing gas from each other and so forth, and gas prices uh, um, went through the roof. Uh, anyway, went from whatever it was, 25 cents a gallon to, you know, a couple bucks a gallon, and uh, everyone was freaking out. Uh, with that, uh, the Arabs were able to, um, because of establishing a cartel with them uh, through the Middle East, uh, gain more power. They then pressured African nations into severing their relationships uh, with the nation of Israel. That was 73. In 75, uh, again, there was a steady drumbeat of anti-Israel things coming out of the, of the UN, uh, moving towards what was then a, a big conference in Mexico called the International Women's uh, Year Conference, uh, followed that by the Organization of African Unity. Uh, and uh, both of those conferences were, the, they were just, uh, there for the, it sounds like it had something to do with women, but it, the whole thing was about uh, uh, basically hammering Israel uh, for their policies and being occupiers uh, and so forth. Uh, and then the UN uh, followed that up with a resolution that said Zionism is racism. So suddenly the Jewish people, because they were able to return to their ancient homeland after being driven out for many years, and the same organization just a couple of decades before gave them the land back again. Now the UN is call, uh, calling them actually race, racist uh, over their policies because they wanted to live in freedom and have the only democracy uh, in, uh, uh, in the Middle East and so forth. Uh, they later came back and repealed that, re that uh, resolution. But uh, the infrastructure established in 1975 uh, continues uh, in the uh, in the United Nations uh, today, and and we're seeing it now with uh, these uh, resolutions from the United Nations, basically coming against uh, Israel uh, for uh, for when they are suspected to, and often it turns out they are not, have something to do with civilians uh, unintentionally being killed uh, during this war. Now Hamas is intentionally trying to kill civilians, uh, and there's, no, there's never a mention of them. It's just a condemnation of Israel. Uh, I, I watched the uh, uh, NBC News tonight just to see how they would cover uh, this school that was uh, a hit uh, a few days ago. Uh, and again, this is the, the sixth school that's been bombed. They, they made a big mention of that and so forth. And, uh, and they've got a reporter right there, of course, uh, you know, uh, it's terrible when, uh, when civilians and, and, and uh, women and children and so forth are being uh, caught up into this. Uh, and there's interviews with them and showing the damaged buildings and the condemnation for the United Nations and so forth. But never do they, they talk about the fact that Hamas uh, uh, makes the people stay there. Uh, they make them stay in dangerous areas. They, uh, they uh, have been condemned from, uh, by the UN for... Um, uh, keeping their cache of missiles at the United Nations uh, relief centers, uh, and then they use their roofs and the playgrounds for where the kids are at for uh, launching the, their missiles uh, and so forth, and martyrs. So when the 
IDF, the Israeli guys, are coming through the streets looking for the tunnels, looking for the Hamas guys, and they start hammering them with, uh, with mortars. They're, uh, mortars they're, they're, uh, they're, they have to return fire to defend themselves in, in the middle of uh, uh, these civilian areas and so forth. So uh, anyway, it's a terrible situation. Uh, Hamas f feels like they can't uh, uh, really defeat Israel. Uh, so they'll shoot 2,000 missiles at them in order to get a response. And then they are hoping, Hamas is hoping there'll be enough of their own people killed uh, so that uh, world opinion uh, and public pressure will uh, turn against Israel and force Israel to give them uh, what, what they want. But uh, anyway, we just need to continue to pray for uh, for Israel, for wisdom, for, uh, for their government right now in a very uh, difficult situation. Uh, obviously, they have a, uh, Israel has enough firepower to obliterate the Gaza Strip. If Hamas had that uh, firepower, they would <laughs> obliterate uh, uh, Israel. But uh, very, uh, very tough situation that they're being asked to, uh, to fight in. A lot of our, our own men and women in our military have had to fight in uh, similar kind of situations uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, where the same thing, you've got uh, uh, Islamic uh, guys uh, that will, you know, put themselves in uh, civilian apartments and, and fire away uh, at, our, at our own troops. And man, they, they have to be very careful when and if they re return fire. And these same guys can take an AK-47, shoot it out a window at our guys, drop the gun, walk out of the apartment. They can't do anything. They actually have to catch them with the weapon in their hand, firing at them before they can return fire. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very different, what they call, asymmetrical warfare that's taking place in the world today. But as far as Bible prophecy, again, this is what the Bible's all, all, always predicted, that in the end, the nations of the world would, uh, would turn against uh, Israel. Uh, now, the last time we covered the signs that would lead up to the sign of Christ's return. Uh, we said that it was uh, like a birth pain increasing in dec decree and frequency uh, as we move towards, uh, again, the first half of the tribulation period. Uh, then we looked at uh, uh, the abomination that causes desolation. That's when the Antichrist will set himself up in the newly rebuilt temple uh, there in Jerusalem, uh, an image of himself that will, in a sense, come to life, this giant idol He'll claim to be God, demand to be worshipped uh, as God. And then at that juncture, Jesus warned the Jews living in Israel at that time they should flee. Uh, and according to the prophet Daniel, from that juncture, from the time the Antichrist does that, then uh, you can count off exactly three and a half years and Christ will return to planet Earth, 1,260 days. Matthew 24, 27 indicates that the return of Jesus to the earth will be sudden. It will be like a stroke of lightning. And again, the uh, events that precede his return are the gathering of the nations against Israel uh, there in the valleys of Megiddo, or what we refer to as uh, Armageddon. Uh, verse 28 indicates that the nations of the earth will uh, be gathered there. That was the, uh, uh, the last verse that, uh, that we covered. Uh, and uh, certainly many of the other prophets speak about this as well. Isaiah 34, uh, 1 to 2 says... Come near, you nations, uh, to hear and heed uh, your pe you people. Let the earth hear and all that is in it, the world and all the things that come forth from it. For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to slaughter. Uh, there's a point in time, again, at the Towards the end of that seven-year period, what we call the time of Jacob's trouble or the time of the uh, Great Tribulation, when, again, the, the nations, the Gentile nations of the, of the world will be gathered against Israel uh, once, uh, once again. Uh, it's, <laughs> you know, we're not living in the tribulations, but you've got a lot of nations that are uh, gathered against them right now. Not with their armies, but uh, uh, that is still yet future. As we go through this... And we get to this, uh, again, I mentioned on Sunday, uh, Jesus will close this section with uh, three illustrations. Uh, one is a fig tree. We'll look at that tonight. Next week will be uh, uh, Noah and how Noah came like a thief uh, in the night. Uh, and then uh, one final one 
uh, those two are really a reference to uh, the rapture and the rapture of the church that we'll look at next week. Uh, but again, keep in mind, uh, this is Olivet Discourse, very Jewish in, uh, in its context uh, completely. Uh, and if we kind of stick to that and understand that, we'll, we'll be able to kind of make sense of these last couple of verses. So again, uh, we're in verse 29. We're at the end of the second half of the tribulation, again, also called the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, I didn't do, a, you guys are here for most of these studies, I didn't do big graphs or anything, but just keep in mind, Daniel predicted, uh, Jesus confirms, and then it's given again uh, in the book of Revelation, that last seven-year period, uh, it, uh, it begins uh, when the Jews are allowed to be, rebuild their temple in Jerusalem, uh, it hits the middle juncture in three and a half years, uh, the Antichrist puts up his, uh, his own image in that temple and demands to be worshipped as God. Uh, and then you can count uh, 1,260 days later to complete the seven-year period, and Jesus Christ returns back to, uh, to planet Earth. That's uh, uh, kind of the, the big picture time frame. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will uh, not give its light. Uh, the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Great glory, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So first thing we note about this, there are physical signs uh, in, the in the heavens. Verse 29, sun is darkened. Moon will not give its light. Stars falling from the heavens. Powers of the heavens will be uh, will be shaken, and the uh, the same kinds of things are mentioned, of course, in the in the book uh, of Revelation. This is second half of that of the tribulation. Second half, we've already looked at the abomination that causes desolation, uh, the Antichrist in the newly rebuilt temple, claiming to be God. We saw that last time. These are things that are happening uh, in the end. And what we're kind of leading up to, and I think kind of the purpose of this section, is to try to encourage people that are living through it. Who's living through it? Uh, the church is not living through this time. Uh, but during the tribulation period, uh, it's still a time of, uh, uh, in a sense, a, a great revival. Yeah, remember, uh, uh, you got 144,000 Jewish Billy Grahams uh, sealed uh, by God, supernaturally protected by them. They're evangelists and they're out preaching, preaching the gospel. Uh, you've got uh, uh, two witnesses uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, some say it's going to be Moses and Elijah uh, that are there. Uh, and uh, it'll be hard for uh, CNN and CNN International to ignore the, the big story there. Uh, and, uh, and they will be there proclaiming the gospel as well. There's going to be a lot of people that, that uh, uh, come to faith. Of course, when they do, they are going to be martyred for, uh, for their faith. How are they going to be martyred for their faith? According to the book of Revelation, they're going to be beheaded. Well, gee, that's happening today, isn't it? That's happening to all the Christians uh, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Syria, and uh, in present-day Iraq. And, and the, there are videos of it, and they are very graphic, and that is exactly what is going on. Uh, men and women and children that are Christians are being slaughtered. Many of them are being decapitated uh, uh, right now uh, in the uh, in the Middle East, uh, so it'll be it'll be a time of people coming to faith in Christ, but it'll be a time of uh, terrible persecution, uh, uh, even as we're seeing in the Middle East uh, today. This text, I think, is meant to be an encouragement to say, "Hang on during those 1,260 days." In other words, will the Jewish nation survive? Will the Jews survive? And according to Jesus, they will. I think that's the. Uh, the thrust here, but there's going to be these um, unprecedented physical signs uh, in uh, in the heavens. Isaiah speaks about it as well. Again, Isaiah 13, 9, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel, with both wrath and fierce anger, to lay uh, the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud 
and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Uh, Again, what's going on during this period is God is punishing the earth. God is punishing uh, people for their rejection of him. God is punishing the powers of this world because of what they're doing right now in the Middle East. A lot of what has to do uh, with uh, the, this time period and these cataclysmic events is a judgment of God, we'd say, against a Christ-rejecting world. But very specifically, in the book of Revelation, there's a group of people that are near the throne of God saying, how long, how long, how long? And those are the people that have been martyred for their faith through the centuries and certainly during that time period. Uh, and, and basically, God says, uh, the time has come. You're not going to have to wait much longer. Uh, this is uh, in, uh, so these things are described, these cataclysmic events, uh, the sun and the moon and so forth, stars falling out of the, the heavens. Joel uh, speaks of it this way in Joel 2.31. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So uh, Joel makes reference to the same kind of uh, physical signs in the heavens, but he also makes reference again to the remnant, this remnant group of Jews uh, that are going to call out to the Lord and be saved. And uh, uh, we'll look at them uh, more towards the end of the text. The second thing, uh, the sign of the, uh, there is a sign of the physical return of, uh, of the Son of Man. Uh, and in terms of why this event here is not the rapture, when Jesus comes for the church, he'll come in the air. His people will be caught up to meet him uh, in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4.17. But at our Lord's second coming, uh, at the end of the tribulation, it's a great public event. Every eye will, will see him. Luke's passage uh, gives it a little more detail, Luke 21, 25. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power in great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption uh, draws near. Whose redemption? The redemption of the Jewish remnant that is uh, uh, waiting and anticipating and look to Jesus as their Messiah. But again, very public event uh, the, uh, their, uh, in a very known date. You can... You can you can, they can put it on their calendar when it's going to happen. From the time the, uh, the Antichrist forms a seven-year deal, a covenant with the nation of Israel, is allowing them to rebuild their temple. You can start counting the days. 1,260 days later, the Antichrist is going to walk into a, the temple uh, and demand to be worshipped as God. Another 1,260 days, and Jesus Christ is coming back to planet Earth. The, the event we call the rapture, Jesus will say, no man knows the day or the hour. You know, so there's great contrast between uh, these two, uh, two events. In terms of the sign uh, of Jesus coming, it will be like lightning. Jesus comes on clouds with great glory. Uh, and uh, at least one idea uh, is the idea that in the Old Testament, Uh, God's glory was always seen in his presence and what's referred to as the Shekinah glory of God. God leads uh, uh, the children of Israel out of Egypt uh, uh, in a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by the day. Visible, obvious, everybody knew it was God. Everybody knew it was his presence. Uh, That seems to be the sign that everybody sees uh, as Jesus Christ comes back to, uh, to planet Earth. Uh, then the, the purpose of the sign, as I've already uh, referred to, is encouragement. I think it's meant to be an encouragement for Israel. Uh, Jesus will return at that hour when Israel is about to be defeated uh, by the Gentile armies, Zechariah uh, 12. He'll rescue them, and they will see him and recognize him as their Messiah. There's going to be national repentance, a national cleansing, a national restor- a restoration under the gracious leadership of Jesus the Messiah. Uh, and again, 
Uh, we shouldn't confuse the trumpet of Matthew 24, 31 here with the trump of God in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. When it talks about his elect in that verse, uh, it's a, a reference to, uh, to the Jews. Uh, in the Old Testament, when, the, uh, uh, when they were uh, wandering through the, uh, the, the wilderness, anytime they were on the move, they uh, blew trumpets to announce that they were packing up uh, shop and they were uh, going on a road trip and they were going to be following uh, the, uh, wherever God's presence led them and they continued to do that. Uh, the trumpets announced events that gave direction, that gave uh, instructions uh, and we see that uh, here. Uh, the Jews have been scattered to the four corners around the world, uh, and the angels of God are going to gather them, uh, just like the priests did in the Old Testament uh, with the use of, of trumpets. And it's interesting, you know, to, um, you know, see, uh, you know, there's, there's Japanese uh, Jews that, uh, that live in Japan. There's Chinese Jews that live in China, you know, all through South America, uh, all over the world. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. They're literally to the four corners of the world, uh, and they are going to be drawn uh, back again. Uh, Isaiah also gives us the place uh, of the second coming, uh, and he says it's going to be uh, in Jordan, uh, again, modern-day Jordan, uh, in the Hebrew, the area is called Basra, and the Greek is called Petra. And this is kind of a, kind of a very graphic uh, picture Isaiah gives of, of Jesus. Jesus comes back. Uh, again, you have the, uh, uh, the armies of the Antichrist on the plains of Megiddo. Jesus returns, according to Revelation 19, destroys them basically with, with the breath of his mouth, with his words. Uh, the uh, Jewish remnant uh, is uh, been surrounded uh, out there in Basra, God's been supernaturally protecting them for three and a half years. The Antichrist is trying to uh, destroy them and uh, annihilate uh, each and every one of them, but they're supernaturally protected. Uh, and now as Jesus returns, uh, he goes to, to rescue them. So when we talk about uh, Armageddon, it's not an event, but actually a series of events. Uh, and one of them uh, is described by Isaiah, Isaiah 63, the first six verses. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? That's the location. This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the people, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought them brought down their strength to the earth. Uh, that's a description of Jesus Christ coming to rescue uh, the Jewish remnant uh, there in, uh, in Basra. And I think this whole passage from Jesus uh, is meant to be an encouragement to hang on uh, because the Messiah will come and he will rescue you. Uh, the purpose of the sign uh, then includes the, the last regathering of Israel there in verse 31. And he will send his angels and with a great sound of a trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven uh, to the other. So Israel being, uh, has been uh, gathered back into the land today in unbelief, in fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, uh, they are gathered back in the land in unbelief today. Now, they're, I mean, they, uh, uh, Israel is a Jewish state, but it's a secular state uh, uh, there's a few messianic synagogues around, uh, you know, I, I think 50 or so. They're very small because you can only walk so far on the Sabbath. So, so you don't get in your car and drive to one. So they're, they're small and they're, they're in neighborhoods, just like all the other synagogues. Uh, but by and large, they have their gay pride parade. I mean, they're as secular as, uh, uh, as, uh, as anybody else. Uh, they're gathered in the land once again in unbelief. Uh, but uh, they will be gathered in the end in belief when Jesus Christ returns for them 
again at the end uh, of the tribulation. Uh, okay, two, the sign is a promise uh, of survival, verse uh, 32 and 35. So Jesus closes this uh, discourse with three uh, kind of admonitions uh, built around three illustrations. As I mentioned, uh, a fig tree, Noah, in uh, a thief in the night. Noah and the thief in the night pertain to the rapture of the church. Why? Because the exhortation is to be ready because no one knows the hour. We know the hour when Jesus returns to, uh, to do battle with the Antichrist forces and to establish his kingdom and so forth uh, because of Daniel's prophets, because of what Jesus has said, because of what we have in the book of, uh, uh, of Revelation and so forth. But in terms of the rapture, no one knows the day or the hour. So we'll look at those two illustrations uh, next week. The first one, though, uh, has to do with uh, the fig tree. And again, it's a parable. A parable simply means to cast alongside. Uh, it's the idea that uh, it teaches one simple truth. And Jesus, of course, was the master teacher, uh, and he taught with parables all the time. He used the same parables that all the other rabbis used. All the parables that you hear Jesus taught were in common use in his day in the first century. He wasn't making them up. Other rabbis taught the same ones. Uh, but Jesus would come along then and give the interpretation. And when he did, he didn't have to quote anybody. He didn't say, and here's what this means, because Rabbi Hillel once said, that's how the other rabbis would do it. Jesus says, here's the parable, and this is what it means. That's why they said, no man teaches like him. Where do you get this teaching? Where is your authority coming from? These are the kind of questions uh, the, uh, the other rabbis would come to him with. Uh, but again, uh, here's a very simple parable uh, of Jesus in regards to uh, the end times. Verse 32, now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also... When you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So the identity of those who receive the promise certainly is, uh, is critical. What's the, uh, again, the main principle, the main point of, of the parable? Uh, well, it's... Uh, uh, read it from uh, Luke's parallel account, Luke 21, 29. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, uh, you, you see and know for yourselves that summer is near. So the parable, therefore, is not about fig trees. <laughs> because uh, in the Luke's passage, he mentions other trees. It's not about fig trees. It's about summer being near. Uh, you can look at the trees and the fruit trees and know that summer is near. The fig tree is not symbolic for the nation uh, of Israel. The context is Jesus talking about when is the Messiah going to come and when is he going to come at the end of the tribulation. Will Israel survive? Will they make it to the end? And he says it's like a fig tree. When you see the fig starting to come, you know that summer is near. When you see these things happen, these cataclysmic events, the things in the heavens, you, Jewish people that are here during that time period, that remnant and other believers know that I am coming and I will come and I will rescue the nation of Israel uh, in time. That's, uh, but um, uh, there, there's other views. <laughs> I sure wish I had thought of this one. Uh, this one says that generation is talking about a 40-year period. Therefore, since the nation of Israel was established in 1948, uh, and there's going to be a generation that will see his return, that means Jesus will return in 1988, right? 48, 40 years, 1988. If I could have just written a book about that, because somebody did, and they sold three and a half million copies. Even a buck a book, you know, I mean, you know, why didn't I think of doing that? But uh, uh, anyway, somebody sold three and a half million cups. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, they're really inexpensive on Amazon today. And, uh, and he came, actually came out with a, with a book later. Um, 
uh, like 80, it was 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. And then he came out later, obviously when Jesus didn't come in 1988, and he actually wrote a follow-up to it and, uh, and said uh, his calculations are off and uh, Jesus really isn't coming back to like 1992 or whatever. He still, still sold like seven or 800,000 other copies. It's just like, you know, it's amazing. You've got to think of these ideas sooner. Uh, again, the, the assumption was that the, the fig tree uh, represented the, the nation of Israel. Uh, and it does. Uh, many times in the Bible, the fig tree is, does symbolize the nation of Israel. In Hosea uh, 9 and 10, in Luke 13, 6 to 10, uh, a picture. Uh, but uh, uh, in this case, it, it really isn't. Um, it was also implied in Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Hal Lindsey does not believe this to be true, but some people perceived it from the book uh, that uh, uh, the fig tree is Israel because it's used of them at other places. It's got to be them. So there's going to be a generation. They become a nation. That's what it's talking about. Jesus is, you know, company. So um, that, that book sold a few copies as well, Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, but at least it brought, and a lot of people got saved. It brought uh, the idea, the attention to people's hearts and minds and imagination. We need to start really looking at Bible prophecy, and it sure would indicate to us that Jesus is coming. The rapture could happen uh, at any time. But again, uh, this is meant to be an encouragement to the remnant of Jews that are suffering through and trying to hang on through that second half uh, of the tribulation. There are others that believe a generation of 70 or 80 years, uh, and then based on Psalm 90, verse 10, uh, you know, they, they set their date that uh, Jesus is coming in, in, uh, in 2018. Uh, of course, some say a generation is uh, uh, 100 years, so some t- time between 2018 and 2028. Uh, that's still yet future, so I don't know if there's books out there or not that you could buy, but I would suggest you not. But that's another view. Some believe that the generation being spoken of was in the first century. Uh, that would be about 80% of the pastors in this country. Uh, we call them all millennial. They're the Reformed guys, all the Presbyterian and Ang- Anglican types and Episcopal, Lutheran, all the Reformers uh, that believe in covenant theology or what we call replacement theology. They believe the generation was in the first century, and this has all already, already happened. Uh, of course, I don't recall the sun uh, turning into blood or stars falling out of the sky. Or I don't remember that happening. So I'm not, not exactly sure. I do know how they explain it. It says this, but it means this. I mean, you know, you just, stars, well, those are personalities. And there were many p- people that, you know, so you just, it says this, but it means something else. You just don't take it literally. That's how they uh, explain it. That's, that's another view. Uh, but again, one, the other view, there's another view. The next generation means children. Uh, that are born to you. This view uh, believes the generations that see the sign of chapter 24 then can know that their children will be the generation that Jesus is, uh, is talking about. But uh, again, the problem with that view is that during the tribulation period, about half the people on the planet are killed. They're dead by the time this whole thing is, uh, uh, is, uh, is over with. Again, uh, back to our text in verse 33. Uh, there Jesus says, see you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. But surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. So what are the these things? It's the things he's just mentioned. Uh, verse 15, uh, we looked at it last week. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. These are the things. When you see these things, the things he just talked about, the Antichrist standing in the newly rebuilt temple uh, with his image there, proclaiming himself to be God and demanded to be worshipped. When you see these things, that generation, it's, you better look and see it's like a fig tree. Man, you see that? Hang on, because Jesus Christ is returning. He will come back uh, and save that, uh, that remnant. Uh, again, uh, the abomination that causes desolation is the thing uh, when you see it, when you see this o- occur. 
uh, it's the middle of the tribulation uh, period. So uh, really what we're saying is that the sign is a promise of survival uh, to the Jewish people, and this whole thing does have to be seen uh, in a Jewish context. Secondly, the promise of survival, again, is for this generation. Jesus is saying there's a generation that will survive the tribulation. He indicates that it's not an age group of people, but rather a nation. They'll survive the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, They will say, he said, they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Again, Matthew 23, looks over Jerusalem. You will not see me again until you say this. You need to recognize I'm the Messiah, uh, and they will see it. Uh, They'll see the birth pains increasing as they go into the tribulation. They'll see the Antichrist and the abomination that causes desolation. They'll be persecuted like they've never been persecuted before. Uh, But again, uh, what is the most important thing to the Jewish people? Bagels. No, you're wrong. It's survival. Survival is the most important thing. That's what they're trying to do today. That's what we're watching on uh, a lot of YouTube clips. uh, Or if you watch uh, one of the few uh, uh, television stations that will give you somewhat accurate uh, information of what's going uh, on on there. Uh, But uh, we're seeing them try to survive. Uh, they are trying to go after Hamas uh, and the uh, very serious missiles that they have uh, aimed at them, shooting at them, all smuggled through the border uh, from Egypt when uh, Morsi was uh, in power, uh, and they're going after uh, these tunnels uh, where they want to be able to come up through them, uh, like they did uh, uh, Galid Shalat and kidnap him. They want to be able to get near the kibbutzes and kidnap children so they can hold them at ransom. Uh, in trade for other Palestinian prisoners and so forth. Uh, And there's been some interesting uh, uh, estimates about the amount of cement and building materials it took to to build these temples, uh, excuse me, these uh, tunnels that are very sophisticated. And to think of the schools and the hospitals, that that's what these building materials were supposed to be for. Uh, when they were allowed to be brought uh, into the country. I've also read a couple of interesting articles about the leaders of Hamas recently. They, like their predecessor, Yasser Arafat, have become wealthy. And they own uh, major apartment buildings and, uh, and, uh, uh, and some very elegant places uh, around the world. I mean, a lot of this aid money that's meant for the Palestinian people, uh, they are the real losers in this, of course, uh, is not going there. Uh, but the, the Jewish people are trying to survive today, uh, and they have been since Pharaoh tried to annihilate them, and then a man named Haman, and then a man named Herod, uh, and then a man named Hitler, and now it's the nations of Islam. Uh, those who follow the Quran today are one in five in the world's population. There's over 20 Islamic countries that are committed to the destruction of Israel, and they pretty much all surround uh, Israel today. Uh, In verse 9, Jesus says, notice, Then they will uh, deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Uh, This did happen, certainly to the apostles, but it certainly is uh, happening right now. Uh, And um, uh, it it has happened at other, uh, other periods in time. I just didn't think I just didn't think we could watch it on YouTube like, like you can now in terms of what's uh, what's taking place. So uh, the the term nation there is the word ethos, uh, and it's usually translated Gentile. So it's these Gentile governments that are coming against the nation of Israel. It's going to uh, get worse. Israel will survive as a nation. They will be around to call upon the name of the Lord uh, and uh, and be saved when Jesus returns. Uh, the sign is a promise to uh, Israel. Uh, Israel can believe the promise because God has been faithful to all of his promises uh, in the past. He promises uh, uh, these things to Abraham uh, in Genesis 12, 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, uh, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And he certainly has, uh, uh, he has, uh, has done that. Uh, uh, and it's very interesting, the uh, the disproportionate amount of Jewish men and women that uh, uh, have made great discoveries in the, in the fields of medicine and science 
uh, completely disproportionate in terms of no Nobel Prize uh, winners uh, and uh, and so forth. He certainly has made their their name great. They've been a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be uh, blessed. And that's a an interesting study just in history uh, itself. Uh, the idea of the nations that uh, have been favorable to uh, uh, Israel or to the Jewish people at one time and then turned their back on them and what happened to those uh, nations and uh, uh, wrote, wrote a paper on it uh, in, uh, in school at one point in time. Uh, it's very, very interesting how that promise is, uh, is still, still true. Uh, the covenant goes on to speak of the promise uh, of the land. Uh, in Psalm 105, verse 8, he remembers his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham uh, in his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I will give the land of Canaan as an allotment of your uh, inheritance. inheritance. Well, uh, one of the... Um, Members of the uh, of the Knesset, um, not Tali Bennett. I forget the actual uh, position that uh, that he holds. He was being interviewed on uh, American television. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think it was probably CNN or CNN International. Somebody that was uh, basically uh, bashing uh, bashing Israel. Uh, and the uh, reporter made reference to Israel as occupiers uh, several times. Uh, and he very. Uh, um, very cleverly happened to have a coin in his pocket that he took out. And he said, this is a coin that is 2,000 years old. And I'll read what it says. It says Zion on it. This is the coin of my homeland where my people have lived, according to this coin, for over 2,000 years. How can you keep calling me an occupier because I live in my Jewish homeland? And that's what this coin says right here. It was a good image, and it was very... Uh, of course, they go, they go back much uh, much longer than that. But again, you constantly uh, hear these things. But God says that uh, my uh, my you know, again, He's promised uh, the land uh, to them. But what if Israel forsakes God? Some would say that. Well, you know, they uh, they rejected the Messiah, uh, not individually, but as a nation. What if uh, they reject God? Psalm eighty nine verse thirty says, "If His sons forsake My law." And do not walk in my judgments. If they break my statues and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with their rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David." His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness uh, in the sky. Again, the, you know, the scripture is pretty clear uh, about all of this. Psalm 21, will God continue to be faithful and keep uh, Israel? I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence my, comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither sleep nor slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and for uh, evermore. Now, there's going to be a, a, a Jewish remnant uh, that is still there in the end. Uh, the Antichrist will be doing all he can. Satan knows the end of the story. Satan knows that if he could obliterate the Jewish people, they will not be here to call Jesus back as their Messiah. If, he, if they're not here, he can't return. Satan remains reigning and ruling here on planet Earth. Uh, so it's always been, he knows the end of the story, his attempt to eliminate uh, the Jewish people. God says over and over again, uh, I won't let that happen. Jeremiah 31 uh, says this, uh, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, when he was still uh, lecturing uh, in uh, colleges uh, and universities, uh, would uh, entitle one of his lectures based on this text, How to Destroy the Jewish People. 
which would get a few people that would come in for that. You'd have Jewish people come in uh, upset that uh, somebody would have a, that kind of a speaker on campus, but you'd, ha- you'd have all of the uh, Islamic types come in because they, w- they want to know how to do it. So he says, I'll tell you how to do it. And it's based on this text here, Jeremiah 31, 35. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea uh, and its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. Uh, If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever, thus says the Lord. If heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So there you go. If you want to get rid of the Jewish people, all you've got to do is get rid of the sun uh, and get rid of the moon uh, and get rid of the stars. You do that and you can get rid of the Jewish people. That's all you've got to, all you've got to do. Again, how does all this apply to, uh, to the church? Well, uh, we love promises like Romans 8, 35. Who shall uh, separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus? In other words, if God is faithful and he's going to keep his promises to Israel, he's going to keep his promises to us. If God lied to the Jewish people and he's not going to keep his promises to them, why would we think he's going to keep his promises to, to, uh, to us? Uh, but um, Paul actually uses uh, that, you know, of course, we all love uh, uh, Romans chapter 8. Uh, the, the chapter about there's no condemnation and there's no separation. That's how it begins, and that's how uh, the chapter uh, ends. And then Paul uses then the nation of Israel in chapter 9, 10, and 11 as the illustration. Uh, this is what God's done in the past, chapter 9. This is how he deals with Israel in the present, uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Uh, that's what was going on during Paul's day and then today as well. Chapter 11, Paul talks about the future of, uh, is Israel, of Israel, uh, where he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am a Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he uh, foreknew. So again, if he, uh, they are the illustration. Uh, Paul says, uh, nothing there's no condemnation to us. Nothing can separate us. Uh, and, and Israel is the example. Here's how God dealt with them in the past, in the present, in the future. God's going to keep his promise. But what if the people aren't, uh, aren't faithful? God's still going to keep his promise. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. So he's going to protect them, the generation uh, that sees the, the abomination that causes desolation, that generation he's going to keep. Uh, for them, uh, the sign uh, of his faithfulness, when they see these things happen, these events, uh, then they can remember it's like a fig tree that goes uh, and begins to bud. Summer is, is near. We would say when you go to the Wimward Mall and you start seeing Christmas lights put up, it's not Christmas, but you know it's coming. Of course, it's getting, they, they put them up sooner and sooner all, this, all the time. But you know, it's, it's not going to happen real quick, but it's, uh, it's coming sooner. Uh, and you know, the more sales and, uh, and all that stuff going on, Christmas is, uh, is getting closer. You don't need a calendar. Uh, that's the point here. It's meant to encourage a generation of Jewish believers who are living through a horrific period of time. And Jesus basically is saying, I am coming, and I will save that remnant uh, in, in the end. Amen? Well, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your, uh, your faithfulness to us and that we can rely upon your uh, promises. Lord, and we do pray for uh, Israel today. We pray that uh, as they have rockets raining down on them, it would cause them to turn their hearts and look into the heavens beyond those rockets, and look to you, and cry out to you. Lord, we thank you that uh, there there are those, some of them we know, uh, that are there sharing the gospel in Israel during this time period. We pray for open hearts and minds, 
The only peace that's going to come is if uh, people invite the Prince of Peace into their hearts uh, and know that their sins are forgiven, to know that they've come into a relationship with the God of their fathers uh, through the Messiah, Jesus. Lord, so we pray for just a tremendous work of your spirit there uh, during this time. We pray for your mercy on the believers and the rest of the Middle East that are being uh, virtually eliminated, persecuted, Lord, even as we, as we speak. We just pray for your mercy and grace to be with them. We pray that there might be a way for intervention to be made to protect as many as possible. Lord, but uh, may your grace be upon them. Lord, we're thankful for the freedoms that we have, and um, they may be uh, failing. They may be less than they were at one time. But, Lord, we still have the opportunity to worship together, to proclaim the gospel publicly. Lord, I pray that we would take uh, advantage of uh, every opportunity that you give us. Lord, uh, because you, you are coming uh, for the church. That's our subject next time. Lord, may we uh, be looking for for it, for it could come at, uh, at any moment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.